This is a Greater Phoenix Market Update for the month of May 2022. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few things like what is it that creates demand and how is our market responding to that and where are we at with it? So one of the things that affects demand is population. So we can have growth or the population can shrink. People can come and go from the state and then in a household, people can come and go from a household. Kids graduate from school and go off to college or get married. Um, grandparents move back in, move into the house with their kids or kids move back in. All sorts of different things can impact the formation of a household. And these things may not affect population, but they definitely impact demand. Now, if the population is growing, there's gonna be more demand in the market. If people are leaving the city, there's gonna be less demand in the market, naturally. And then there's affordability. How many people out there in our population can truly afford to buy a house in Greater Phoenix? Things like employment levels and income levels definitely impact somebody's ability to own a house. And here in Phoenix, about 40% of our housing population are renters. So a lot of people either choose to rent or can't afford to buy. Now, when home prices depreciate, more people can afford to buy. When they appreciate, typically, less people can afford to buy. And then there's always lower rates and higher rates. Interest rates make a big difference. So we're gonna talk a lot about those a little later on. So income and interest rate will have a big impact on somebody's decision to downsize or upsize. All of these things impact affordability. Another thing is lending practices. Lending practices can become really conservative or very loose like they were back in 2005 and 2006. They had the what they call the statement loan. If you had a heartbeat, you could get a loan. It was also called the liar loan because all you had to do was state your income, tell them how much you made, and they believed you. They qualified you based on that. And then there's consumer sentiment. This is where emotion comes into play. If people feel like things are generally moving in a positive direction, you'll see people taking the risk to buy rather than pulling back and not buying. Okay, here's what's going on with affordability in our market right now here in Phoenix. If you took the median priced home a year ago, it would have been priced right around $365,000. And today, that same home is priced right around $470,000. Now, a year ago, when prices were starting to go up, people didn't verbally say it, but through their behavior, you could tell they didn't really care what the price was. All they cared about was, is it cheaper than renting, and could they afford it, and what's the payment? But now, things are different because as prices have gone up, so have interest rates very quickly. What's happened here in the last three months hasn't happened since the 1980s. And what's happened is rates have gone from the high twos, low threes, all the way up into the mid fives. So those two things combined have made a giant difference in what people can afford. Here's my example. You see this house where they're paying $365,000 and then over here they're paying $470,000? Well, Let's just take a look at what happens when you're paying a low interest rate versus a little bit higher interest rate. Here's what happens. You go from having a $1,300 a month payment all the way up to a $2,300 a month payment. That's a difference of $1,000 a month. And I don't know anybody who thinks $1,000 isn't a lot of money. Anybody who's paying rent right now can actually rent that same house for about $500 less than they would buy it for. And so a natural reaction is to pull back, decide not to buy, and hang out and just rent a house for a while until the market kind of straightens itself out. Now, what's happened with leasing? Well, that's another thing. Uh, lease rates have gone sky high over the last few years. So if you would have been renting a simple three bedroom, two bath house back in 2020, you would have been expecting to pay around $1,700 a month. Today, it's around $2,250 a month, about $500 a month higher. So rents are definitely going high. 
and there's pluses and minuses for renters. You can get out of that house at the end of the lease, or you can continue on, but you're going to pay the market rate. And so if the lease rate is going up, you're going to be subject to that. Whereas if you would have bought a home, your payment is generally fixed and you don't have to worry about it going up unless you get an adjustable rate loan. Now, what about income? You can see this color-coded map shows various income layers all throughout the state. The darker the color, the higher the income. But in Phoenix, the median income is just under $60,000. And somebody buying a $470,000 house with no debt, no car payment, no credit card payment, really can't qualify for that house anymore. They're a few thousand dollars a year away from being able to buy that house. This difference in interest rate has choked out the market for a lot of people, and they may have had aspirations to buy, but they can no longer do it. This graph shows us a uh, appreciation of real estate in the Phoenix metro area over the last 21 years. And it's telling us that the average is about 8.6% per year. So you can see from this May to last May, the median price went up 5.7%. And here on Zillow, they are attempting to show the advantage of buying. This has been a powerful tool for real estate agents for a long time. But in this case, they're showing that your payment is going to be around $2,800 on this $470,000 house. And one of the things they're trying to point out here is that the remaining principal at the end of five years is $390,000. So that's about an $80,000 gain equity without appreciation. Now, the possible market value of the home after five years, let's just figure at 6%. I think that's realistic since we just demonstrated that you know, the market has been appreciating at 8.6% for the last few years. So let's say 6%. If that happens, your house is now going to go from 470 up to $629,000. So you've gained $159,000. Now, none of us has a crystal ball. We don't know that this could happen, but this is a realistic scenario. And if you re refinance and get out of the PMI, you're going to save another $208 on your monthly payment and the potential equity after five years now jumps up to $239,000. That's something you just can't do with rent. Now, what about mortgage rates? Are they gonna go down or are they gonna stay high? Well, if you look at this chart, you can see back in 1982, they were as high as 18.63%. I know my dad owned a house at that time, bought a house, and in order to get his interest rate lower, he had to buy the rate down. He had to throw several thousand dollars at the loan just to end up with a 13% interest rate instead of an 18% interest rate. And over the course of the last 30 years, or the last 45 years actually, if you average out the interest rate, it comes out to about 8.2%. 8 and the lowest interest rates showed up right here during COVID, and they were right around two and three quarters percent. Some people even boasted about getting lower interest rates than that. So this slide shows us what's happened in our market. And we've gone from a market of exhilaration to a market of euphoria to a little bit of unease, right? People are noticing it's taking longer to, see their ha to sell their house. Fewer people are coming to see their homes. Now, it's still a total seller's market, but it's instead of taking seven days to sell a house, it might take nine days. So uh, still an insane market, but just not quite as crazy as it was just a few months ago. Now, what are you seeing in the paper? That really affects us, right? What we read online back in 2013, they say, why the fast rise in home prices doesn't equal a bubble. And then the next headline, a couple of weeks later, says, real estate euphoria is America in a new housing bubble. And then another report a couple weeks later from The Economist says, no U.S. housing bubble. And then the next guy says, uh, re reports show no Phoenix housing bubble. And then the next one says, we're in another housing bubble. So these guys don't know. They just have to have something to write about. But it definitely impacts how people feel and how people behave in the market. And it just goes on and on as the years go by. More of these headlines continue to get cranked out because it's what writers do. It's what 
news channels do in order to get people to engage and listen. All kinds of economists make predictions. Uh, more than 50% of the time, they're wrong. A monkey could probably uh, forecast the future of the economy several years down the road as good as these guys can. And so it just keeps on going, right? They keep on saying, we're in a housing bubble, we're not in a housing bubble. It's really hard to follow. But here's a comparison. This chart shows us a comparison of the bubble back in 2005 and 2006. You know, as, the, as we kind of worked our way out of the, these high prices, prices came way down and we experienced a correction. And then prices from 2013 on started to gradually go up. And then as we hit 2018 or so, they just started going very vertical. Prices went up very quickly, very fast. But here's the big difference between that 2005 through 2008 era and our current appreciation. Back in 2005 and through 2008, we had 100% financing. There was no equity from the start and there was a high foreclosure risk for the banks. And for today's buyer, there's significant down payment. A lot of the homes are being paid with cash. Back then, there were a lot of short-term loans, interest-only payments, low payment, no principal, reduction and large blue payments at the end of a short term. When loans converted to include principal, the payments often doubled. This it was another high foreclosure risk. And today's owner is getting loans that include principal and interest. Principal reduction is built into the payment, so there's very low foreclosure rate right now. Next thing to look at are interest rates. Uh, back then, a lot of people used adjustable rate loans, very risky, adding to foreclosure risk. Today, almost all the mortgages are fixed rate loans. Now, back then, the buyers were very unstable. There were lots of people without credit, bad credit, Again, they had the stated income loan, high foreclosure risk, and today's buyer is much more stable, higher credit rating, higher income, very low foreclosure risk. And back then, a lot of times, there was never an intent to actually occupy the home or get the home rented out because everybody thought it's just going to go up so fast. By the time uh, you know a couple months go by and I make a couple payments, the thing's going to make me a lot of money and I'm going to sell it and, and take the cash. Today, that isn't happening. When people buy with the purpose of investing, they buy with the intent of renting the property out or they plan on living in the house. So you can tell there's a big difference between that era and this one. One more comparative, new home builders. Back then, the development was outpacing the population growth for 10 years. In other words, they were building them as fast as they possibly could. Materials were cheap, and the builders felt so confident that they just overbuilt the market. And then when it turned, they were held holding the basket. Today, the builders can't keep up with the demand. Their uh, materials are very expensive, and there's a real short of, of tradesmen to build these homes. So the builders are not ahead of themselves, and they're building at a pace that the market can easily absorb. One other big difference, Wall Street. Back then, there was lots of speculation on Wall Street. These mortgages were getting bundled up and sold. There were very high risk loans being bundled up and sold and Wall Street was eager to invest in these and ultimately it led to their demise. And today, the Wall Street money is betting on rentals. They're putting all their chips in on properties that can be built with the intent of renting them out. So investors are buying these rental properties as they get built and the builder's intention is to sell them to either individuals or Wall Street REITs who can afford to buy big packages of these homes. And here's some headlines. Uh, Scottsdale Builder kicks off more Arizona build to rent and for sale home projects. Taylor Morrison forges $850 million joint venture with the build to rent investor. So lots of that stuff is going on right now. We didn't have that back then. Now the active rental supply is going up. We have more rentals than we did before. And part of the reason is that people are just getting priced out of the housing market in terms of being able to buy. You can see the supply is rising in the rental market also because 
it's taking longer to rent these homes than before. So you'll notice on this slide that the rental supply is on the rise, and this slide shows the Ahwatukee area, same thing, rents are coming up, same thing with the Northeast Valley cities, all the areas, all the sectors of the valley, Southeast, Pinal County is up 197%. That's a ton. West Valley cities up 82%. Back to the uh, Southeast Valley is up 71%. So there's a big rise in the rental supply. Part of the reason this is happening is it's just taking longer to rent the homes. And as it rises, it these rentals kind of compete with each other. Let me show you what I mean. So you see these two lines where they converge and they come together and they they, uh, they, they spread apart. What's happening here is you got two lines. One is the median income list price for the rent, and the other, the green, shows the actual closed rent rate. So you can see the sellers or the rent, the, the landlords were getting all the money they were asking for back here. And then right as 2002 started, that, those two lines started to spread apart because the landlords were no longer getting as much as they were demanding. So if they're asking for 3,000, now they're getting 28.5. If they're asking for 1,600, now they're getting $1,475 or something like that. So you can see this big gap here is what tells us that there's, although the demand is high, the landlords don't want their properties empty for a long time. So if it's taking longer to rent it out because there's more to choose from, they're doing whatever they have to do to get their property leased and under contract because they know the longer they wait really impacts their bottom line at the end of the year. And you can see as we explore these various areas, City of Maricopa is one area where you're seeing same shape. This is uh, Queen Creek. This is Buckeye. You can see here the prices difference is $83 in Buckeye. It's um, $105 in Queen Creek, and in City of Maricopa, it's $154. So these rents are really starting to come down, and you know landlords are going to do what they got to do to get the place rented. So let's look at new listings in Metropolitan Phoenix and see the difference between 2021 and 2022. In 2021, we had 10,833. Right now, we have 10,083, about 800 fewer listings than we did then. Now, here you can see 2022 and 2021, uh, the shape of the line where it shows us the new weekly listings that come onto the market. So you can see we're about the same place as we were last year. The number of weekly accepted contracts is going down. So contracts are going down, and in the greater Phoenix area, listings under contract is also down 13% as compared to this time last year. So the active supply right now is on the rise. This is 2021, this blue line, and you can see uh, we're up 41% over the last couple months here in Phoenix um, in our supply. So supply is up big time compared to this time last year. Now, what about at various price points? Here in the four to $500,000 home, you can see that the supply is up 117%. You heard that right, 117%. That's a big rise in supply, four to $500,000. What about half a million to a million? It's up 117%. Homes priced between a million and 1.5, those listings, the active supply is up 38%. This chart shows us active supply and under contract. In this column, we see the change from last year to this year in terms of active supply. This column, we show the change this year compared to last year, homes under contract. So from last year, homes under $300,000, we're down 36% on supply, and we're down 66% from last year. There's a couple reasons for this. Number one, there's a lot less $300,000 homes. Those are just becoming like an extinct species, right? Number two, a lot of these buyers who would be moving into those homes because of interest rate and price, 
they can no longer afford these homes. So it's really putting a squeeze on that lower end market. Now, similar thing is occurring three to $400,000. Active supply is down 10, 10% and um, number of homes under contract down 37%. Interestingly, homes between four and $500,000 are up 117% from last year, number of active listings. And the supply or the homes under contract is up 31% as well. And you can just see as you go through all the numbers here, this changes drastically de depending on price point. Let's look at one more. Five to $600,000 active supply is up 160% and uh, con under contract is up 41%. So these numbers make a big impact on what homes are going to sell for in the very near future. So this slide is gonna show us price changes from week to week. Here we're looking at the four to $500,000 price range. In the last three weeks, we're seeing a 71% increase in price changes. If you examine the MLS, one of the things that really stands out is when you look at homes now, as compared to a few weeks ago, you can see that there are tons of price decre decreases coming onto these houses because people want to get them sold no matter what the interest rates are doing. And here we're looking at homes five to $800,000. The increase in price drops is 150%. And 800 to 1.5, it's 125%. So lots of price decreases all across the board here in the Phoenix area. Now, what about the Cromford Market Index? The Cromford Market Index tells us where our market's at right now so that we can have a feel for making our buying or selling decisions. And here's how it works. When the Crawford market index is over 110, the market is considered a seller's market. Prices rise more than the rate of inflation. When the Crawford market's index is between 90 and 110, the market is considered to be balanced. Prices roughly follow the rate of inflation. When the Crawford market index is below 90%, the market is considered to be a buyer's market. Now we're still very much in a seller's market. It may not be as crazy as it was back, back here, but it is still a strong seller's market. And you can see these indicator, the Crawford supply versus demand. We can see that the demand is about neutral. Demand is very much in the middle. The market index is telling us that we're at 350. That dropped 76 points but still, this tells us that we are in a very strong seller's market. Even though demand is kind of neutral, we're in a strong seller's market. That's because, look over here, supply is very low. Even though supply has jumped significantly, it's still not nearly enough to, um, to feed the demand that does exist out there. Here you see the line for 2022 as compared to 2021. And this may be just following a seasonal thing, uh, but it does appear that it's dipping pretty significantly here as compared to last year. So it may come around and curl back up and follow the trend. Or if it keeps going down, that's going to make it a little bit more of a buyer's market. But we'll just have to wait and see. This is just telling us that right now prices are projected to continue rising a little bit, but slower in the next coming months, slower than before. And yeah, it's this is not a normal market. I mean, I'm not sure how you would define normal, but I think most people would call it neither a seller's or a buyer's market, just kind of a balanced somewhere in the middle market. So here's a, a slide that demonstrates the demand across the valley. Here's baseline, kind of the normal range. And when these numbers are below that baseline, it means demand is a little bit lower than normal. That's Scottsdale, Paradise Valley, Phoenix, uh, Fountain Hills, Cave Creek. Let's look at um, cities in the West. The demand is higher in Goodyear. It's above normal in Buckeye. It's a little below normal in Surprise, Glendale, Peoria, and Avondale. And then if we look at the Southeast cities, we can see in Queen Creek, it's pretty much right at baseline, normal. And then Mesa, Tempe, Chandler, and Gilbert are all below normal, while Maricopa is well above more normal. The demand is extremely high. Uh, that number is 141. So 
remarkable that the city of Maricopa still has extremely high demand. Now, this chart shows us the discrepancy between supply and demand. Okay, so if we look back at 2005, uh, this red line shows supply, the green line shows demand. So what happened is demand went way up high and the supply was way down. So the builders said, we'll fill that demand. And they built like crazy and they got so much supply on the market that all of a sudden demand started to fall way off because there was no sense of urgency. There was so much supply on the market, people could buy whatever they wanted to. They there wasn't slim pickings. There was tons of stuff to pick from. So the supply was very high and the demand was low and interest rates uh, started to creep up and really push people away from being able to, to buy at that time. This is between 2007 and 8. During this era, 07 to 08, the market was really starting to crash and um, there were a lot of houses on the market. And then you know, there were some incentives introduced into the market, and then all of a sudden, some of these homes started to get gobbled up, and you can see these numbers come together, and they, they converge, and then they go apart. And when they're touching, the market is balanced. And when they're apart, it's either a seller's market or a buyer's market. So you can see we've come and gone in and out of those markets several times. But since 2014, when things started to get straightened out and the supplies really started to get absorbed, we have not had a buyer's market since that time. Because we're so far apart right here and right now between supply and demand, you can tell it's going to take some time for these uh, two lines to converge again. Never do they go up and immediately race back down. They kind of take some time and they meander their way back down. So although uh, demand isn't quite as high as it was a few months ago, and supplies coming up, it's still gonna take several months before we get into a buyer's market again. What about contract ratios? Number of homes on the market versus number of homes under contract. Well, you can see uh, this is since 2016 and it shows we're a pretty stable market. Uh, COVID hit and all of a sudden, Phoenix started to have a frenzy. People were moving here from various states because their employers are telling them, we don't care where you work, you can keep your high paying, paying job here in San Jose, California. If you want to move to Arizona, go ahead and do it. So they did. They came here and homes were selling like crazy and going up in value. So the contract ratio really started to go up during this insane period of time. You can see it's starting to come down a little bit. We're still in a frenzy, not quite as insane as it was, but it is definitely still a frenzy. So what about flips? Okay, uh, this chart shows from 2012 up until now. And you can see that in March 2022, we had 1,158 flips during the month of March. And you can see that if you just go back a year before that, that there were several hundred fewer flips on the market at that time. Now, what about the institutional flippers? These are companies that just buy and sell houses because they think that that's the thing to do. They think, I kind of think they're a little full of themselves. Let's look at the open door story. Also, Offerpad, Redfin, Open Door showed its first profitable quarter. How did they do that? That's the big question. You know, uh, I sold my brother's house to Open Door. I couldn't believe all the money that they paid for his house. They were absolutely overpaying, um, but he was able to close on it and they paid about $70,000 more for his house than anybody else in the market did. This chart shows us what's happened with Open Door, and we're gonna get to the crux of the biscuit and see why they bought so many homes, why they sold so many homes, and why they are able to claim a profit. So here, back in May, November, um, they were buying like crazy, buying, 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 and then the number dips like crazy back in December and March. Now, here is where we see the sales at Open Door. Back in November, remember they were buying a lot, so now this number, this bar is down, but then all of a sudden it shoots up and they were selling a bunch of homes in uh, December through March. Now, why is that? Is it because they wanted to make a big profit? Yeah, of course it is. At least they wanted you to think that if you're an investor with them on Wall Street. But here's what really happened with these guys. This is another chart showing what OfferPad did. Um, and it's kind of the same extreme, but let's see 
what happened with this open door activity. What really matters here is we're looking at the Phoenix homes at the top and all the various cities throughout. Many of the sales were in Phoenix. This first bar shows 336 sales um, were in Phoenix during the first quarter. And it, this column over here shows that the median price loss is $42,700 and the maximum loss is $140,700. So they lost on average in the middle right around $42,000 per house. But, and it just keeps going. Like that's why this whole column is red because in every city, just about every city, they had a minimum loss, you know, well over $30,000 and in most cases, well over, you know, $40,000. So this next chart shows us offer pad has less red, but they have some. So they were making some mistakes, but not near as many as offer pad. So this is how offer pad did it. They bought a bunch of houses, they sold a bunch of houses at a loss, but they got a whole bunch of money in the coffer showing that during this very short period of time, they made a lot of money. But in truth, they lost a lot of money because they paid up here and they sold down here. So it was really kind of a shifty way to show a profit. They really didn't make a profit if you look at the overall year. They just made a profit during a very short period of time because they sold a lot of homes at a big loss. Now here, this chart's showing where we're at with median priced homes all across the valley. Right now, we're about $485,000. And the average price per square foot from April to date jumped up from April 2021 at $245 a square foot to today's price of $305 a square foot. This chart shows the median days on market. There's a couple outliers here when the internet went down over in, <clears throat> in England when Michael Orr was compiling some of this information. He lives in England at least part of the time. So uh, there was a little outage and they didn't get all the data collected. But you can see over the last few months, uh, average days on market is around seven days. And it's gone up a little bit since then, but not very much. And the appreciation size, sales price ratio, and days on market, the annual appreciation for homes under 300 was, is around 13.6%. Homes 300 to 4,000, 28%. 4 to 500, 18%. So these are really good, strong numbers for sellers. And then the sales price compared to list price is 103, 103, 103, 102. This means it's selling for about 3.5% in this case over the list price. And the median days on market are relative on the side, I would say, averaging out around seven or eight days. Now, this chart shows concessions. That means the seller is contributing to the buyer's cost to get into the house. And you can see back in 2020 during COVID, there was a pretty good amount of this going on. But as time went by and all those people from California started moving here, sellers didn't work, have to work very hard to attract buyers. So that's why you see this thing sliding down so ra rapidly. And by the time June 2021 got here, uh, there were hardly any concessions at all, less than 5%. What about foreclosures? This is a pre-foreclosure chart. You can see back in 08, 09, the foreclosures were sky high. They represented a large portion of our inventory. Since then, it's dived down. 2014, it really started to get low. And right now, we've got about 337 notices of foreclosure going out, meaning if those homeowners don't make it right, their home could go up to auction. That's probably not gonna happen in most cases because the appreciation has been so great that people have more equity in their homes right now than they used to, unless they borrowed a bunch of money against them. So this shows the trustee deeds by month. The deeds going back to a trustee who holds the note um, because somebody hasn't made their payments. You can see it's hardly visible. It's almost off the map. There are only 21 notices that went out in the month of April. So only 21 homes went back to fore, went, got foreclosed on. So in summary, um, rent versus buy, right now you're gonna spend about $500 more per month to buy than you would rent last year. That's up 70% since September, 2021, up 
3% since January 22, and 38% of all leases closed under the asking rent, 67% in the city of Maricopa. Now, the resale supply is up, and weekly list price reductions are rising. From four to $500,000, the supply is up 35% in three weeks, and the price reductions are up 71%. From 500 to a million, the supply is up 99% in six weeks, and the price reductions are up 147%. Price between a million and 1.5, the supply is up 54% in six weeks, and price reductions up 150%. Now, measures that change before sales price measures respond include list price weekly reductions, days on market prior to contract, and sales with seller concessions. So to continue our summary, March through April, week four, the March median sales price was 462, April to date, 470. March appreciation based on square foot equaled 25.8% as compared to April to date at 24.4%. March sales over asking price equaled 54.3%, April to date, up 57%. The March median price over list was about $16,000, April to date about $20,000. Now the March sales price versus list price ratio is about 101%, April to date is still right around 101.8%, and so far in May it's 102.5. The median days on the market prior to contract is about seven days. April last year was about the same, seven days. I'm John Cunningham, and if you'd like to get a real glimpse of what's going on in your neighborhood with prices and value, this should help a lot. But every neighborhood, every house is unique. Just give me a call, and we'll go through the numbers together and figure out what's the best thing for you. Thanks for watching.